Hi everyone! In this video, I will show you how to implement the Black-Scholes-Merton model for European options pricing within Python. Before we get started, let's review the packages we will use, which include math, scipy, datetime, numpy, and matplotlib. Let's start by defining what an option contract is. Options are a contract that allow the buyer of a contract to buy or sell an underlying asset at a specified price. A call option allows a contract holder to buy an underlying asset at a certain price, while a put option allows the holder to sell the underlying asset at a specified price. I think the best way to actually get a good idea of what an option is, is to go through an example. Let's say we have today's date, November 24th, 2021 and we decide to buy a call option, specifically on Apple. What the call option will allow us to do is it allows us to buy 100 shares of Apple at the expiration date, which is January 17th, 2022. The initial cost is quoted as $1.58. Now, when we get this quote, we need to multiply it by 100 because it's for 100 shares which brings the total cost to $158. The strike price, or the price that we can buy the Apple shares at, is $160. Now, let's go into the future on January 17th, 2022. We see that the current value of Apple stock is $165, and we decide to execute the call option. What this allows us to do is we can purchase the Apple shares at $160 per share. And this is lower than the current value of the shares, which are trading at $165. And again, we purchase 100 shares of these. Let's calculate the net profit of this. What we do is we take the current value and we subtract it by the strike price, 160. That gets us $5. Further, we have to subtract the $1.58, which is the cost of the option. Next, we multiply this by 100, because again, we have 100 shares. This brings our net profit to $342. Now that we have an idea of what an option is and how the contract works, let's get into the core of this video, which is the Black-Scholes-Merton model for pricing European options. The model was first developed in 1973 by Fisher Black, Robert Merton, and Myron Scholes. The model is used to price European options, which can only be executed at the end of the expiration date of an option. This differs from an American option, which can be executed at any point in time before or on the expiration date. What we'll have to do first is we'll have to go through the assumptions of the model. And what I'll point out is that these assumptions are fairly strict and, un and unrealistic. Keep that in mind, but this is what we have to do in order to actually implement this model. First, the first assumption is that no dividends are paid out during the life of an option. Again, this is unrealistic because we know that dividends will be paid out for a lot of stocks, including large cap stocks such as Apple. Next, the model assumes that the returns follow a random walk. That This means that there's no real great way to predict how the stock price will move over time. The third assumption is there are no transaction costs in buying the option. If you go through a broker, they'll obviously charge you a transaction cost. Again, this is unrealistic, but for our model to work, we make this simplifying assumption. Next, the risk-free rate and volatility of the underlying asset are known and constant. The risk-free rate or the interest rate that we will use to price an option as well as the volatility is time varying. So this is another assumption that's unrealistic. Next, the returns on the underlying asset are log normally distributed. This is closer to being true it depends on which stocks you look at, but a lot of stocks do follow some sort of log normal distribution with fatter tails usually. 
Finally, the option is European. And like I mentioned before, that means it can only be exercised at the expiration date. Great. Now let's get into the formula. And there are a few inputs that we'll need in order to actually implement this model. The first is the underlying asset price. In our case, just to simplify things, I'll only talk about options on stocks. So we can think of this as the current stock price for the underlying asset. And I'll use Apple stock throughout this video. Next is the option strike price. And like we saw for a call option, that's the price at which you can buy the shares at that given price. Next is the interest rate. And this is the risk-free rate that we'll use to discount the option. And the interest rate, because this is something in the future, we need to discount this to the present value. Next is the dividend yield, which needs to be incorporated because if any dividends are paid out, that will affect the value of the shares and the options price. Volatility, which is how a the price of how spread out the price of a share can move and finally time which is how long do we have to for the option to expire and we have these two d1 and d2 these are the first calculations that we'll make and what we'll do is we'll take the natural log of the stock price divided by the strike price added by the interest rate subtracted by the dividend yield subtracted by the volatility squared or the variance divided by two multiplied by time and so on and so forth then once we actually get to calculating the values we have this these two formulas here one for a call option which again allows us to buy shares at a specified price and one for a put option which allows us to sell shares at a certain price and later on once we actually get to coding this out i'll describe what nd1 and nd2 mean and let's actually get into putting together our function so what i'll do is i'm going to create a function and i'll call it black shoals merton and this is the black shoals merton model and this function is going to have six input parameters. What I'll say, since we're only working with equities, the first input is going to be the stock price. Next is going to be the strike price. After that, we have the interest rate, which I'll just call rate. Time, which is how long the option has till expiration. Volatility. And finally, dividend. And what I'll do for a dividend is I'll put in a default value, which means that in some cases there are stocks that don't pay dividends. And the default assumption will be when somebody's using this function that the stock does not pay any dividend. What I'll do next is I'm going to calculate D1 and D2. And let's do that right now. We have that in here. Then we'll have to actually calculate the value of the call and put. And this gets us back to the ND1 and ND2. And what these are is we're going to call the stats function from SciPy to return the cumulative normal distribution function. And this ND1 and ND2 is the probability that an option will be exercised in a risk neutral world. And we'll need that to return our estimated price of the call option or the value of the call option and the put option as well. Finally, what I'm going to do in this function is I'm going to return a list. The first portion will be the call and the second will be the put. Let's run this. Great. Next, what I'll do is I'll also put in a explanation here. And if we have somebody that's 
doesn't quite know about Black Shoals, or maybe this is their first time using Python, they can use the help function on our function to explain this. Just to demonstrate, our little explanation here breaks down the parameters or the inputs, and then it also breaks down what the return is going to be for the function as well. Okay, let's actually write out our function now, and let's try this out. What we have for our function is we have a option that we're looking to value, or two options, with where the underlying price of the stock is $105, the strike price is $100, the risk-free rate is 5%, there's one year until expiration, the volatility is 25% on it, and the option the stock does have a dividend yield too as well. And we have the value of the call option here and the value of the put option here. And we can also check this. I highly recommend using Wolfram Alpha's options calculator. I think they do a great job, but there are plenty of other calculators if you've used any. And let's just take a look at this. We have all the same inputs put in here. And here we have the value of the call option, 1493. And that lines up with our calculation. We can also check the value of the put option. And the value of the put option is $6.10. And when, if we round up, we'd get 610. Our formula seems to be working well, and I highly recommend using Wolfram Alpha if you have any calculations. They have so many different calculators that you can use. Okay, moving on. Let's describe this. And if we have the Black Shoals function, we have the call option and the put option. And just to get everyone used to the nomenclature, when we the price of the underlying asset is above the strike price for a call, call option, it's called in the money. In terms of the put option, it would be out of the money. And you would, at the end of the expiration, if the option were in the money, then you would exercise it. For the call option, you would end up exercising it, assuming the transaction cost makes sense. But for a put option, you would let the option expire worthless. And if this were changed, where the underlying asset were $95 and the strike price was $100, then the option would be in the money for a put option and it would be out of the money for a call option, meaning that you would exercise the put option, but you would not exercise the call option. And finally, if the strike price and the underlying assets price are the same, then it's said that the, the option is at the money. And we just have this very simple function here to help so in this case, the call option is in the money and the put option is out of the money. Let's bring it to 95. In the case of that, the call option is out of the money and the put option is in the money. And if we set this to 100, then both of the options would be at the money. All right, now let's take a look at what happens when we change some of the parameters of the Black-Scholes model. And the first thing I'll do is I'm going to change the underlying price of the asset and see how that affects both the call option and the put option. Let's run this. And here we can see that as the value of the asset rises, so does the value of the call option. And this makes intuitive sense because when we go long a call option or we buy the call option, then we are making an estimate that the value of the underlying asset will rise. And we want that to happen if we're just buying the call, call option by itself. Let's run this for the put option as well. 
And this makes intuitive sense as well, because a put allows us to sell the underlying asset. And as the, as the price of that asset rises, then the, the value of our put falls. But as the underlying asset starts to fall in value, then the value of our put option will increase because we can sell it at a given price and we can avoid having these losses. And that's why put puts are used as insurance in case the, val the value of the underlying asset does start to fall. Next, let's take a look at how the strike price affects our model at different points. And this is what happens as we start to increase the value, the, stri the strike price for a call option. And we can see that it starts to fall. And this makes intuitive sense as well, because the strike price allows us to buy, the given strike price is the point at which we can buy the Apple stock. Oh, if in our example, again, Apple shares were trading around $105, but the call option that we hold is $130, then we wouldn't exercise it because we can just buy it in the spot market and the call option would expire, wor expire worthless. However, if we still, if the asset is here at $105, and we have a call option at $80 or call option with a strike price at $80, then we would just take the difference of that, which is 25, and we would purchase the shares, 100 shares at expiration. Then we would sell them at $105 and we would net a $25 profit. Next, let's take a look at how the put option affects it. And as the strike price increases for the put option, the value of the option increases as well. And just to make sense of this, let's say that we have Apple shares. Currently, they're trading at $105, but I at one point bought a call option that allows me to sell the underlying assets or the Apple shares at $120. And it's if it's the expiration date and the, the Apple shares are trading at around 105, I have a put option with a strike price of 120. I would sell the shares and make a $15 profit off of that. Volatility is one of the more interesting ones, and it is a input that we actually can't observe in the market itself. And in a future video, I'll show how to calculate implied volatility or the volatility of an option. And we can see here that as the volatility increases, so does the value of an op of the call option. And we'll also see that in it increases with the put option as well. They're both going the same way and they're both increasing in value as the volatility increases. And this is because if there's higher volatility, then there's higher upside or downside, meaning that our option could finish well above the current strike price or well below the current strike price and could net a trader a hefty return, which makes it more valuable. Moving on, let's check out how time affects it. And time is a bit tricky because I'll reference a book down below by John C. Hole, but there are ways that dividends could affect this, but that's beyond the scope of this video. I highly recommend checking this out. But in this case, we'll assume there aren't any dividend payments for this option. Let's, let's run this. And we can see that as the time increases for this call option and as time increases for the put option as well, the value of the option increases. 
And this makes sense because as there's more time, then the price can move more favorably in either up or down in the way that we want it to. However, it's very unlikely that the price of the underlying stock or Apple stock will move widely in a very limited time frame, which is why time in general is more valuable. But again, it depends and there are caveats. And I highly recommend checking out John C. Hole's book, which goes into this further in depth. Next, we have interest rates. Let's run. And as the interest rates increase, we can see that the value of the call option increases because in this case, holding a call option is akin to being short bonds. And as interest rates increase, bond values decrease. On the other side, we have put options decreasing as the interest rates increase. And the going long a put is similar to going long a bond. Let's take a look at how dividend yields affect the value of the call options and put options. And as the dividend values increase, the value of a call option decreases. This is because after a dividend is paid out, then the value of the stock will fall or tends to fall. And same thing for a put value, since we're expecting a fall in the price of the of the shares after it goes X dividend, then the value of the put will should increase as well. All right, finally, let's compare the Black Scholes Merton model to the live market. And what I also need to do is before we get into this, I need to calculate the annualized days for the expiration. And it's going to take two parameters, date one and date two. And once we input these, then we're going to return date two minus date one dot days divided by 365. And I'll explain this function more as we move on. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the value of a Apple call option. So bringing this down, what we're going to do is we're going to look at how our model is going to price a Apple call option expiring in February 18th, 2022 of next year, a strike price of 160, Apple is currently trading at $161.94 at the close of the business day. And the implied volatility from the market estimate is 28.88%. Apple also has a dividend and the forward dividend yield is estimated to be at 0.55%. We also need to put in rates and for this it can get a bit tricky given that rates are too low currently. but we can try to see the difference between the three month and the six month yield. But given that they're so close, you usually also want to match up the rates to the time left in the option. And it's somewhere between three and six months. It won't exactly be that. We'll first try the 0.10%, see what that gets us. Okay. So I have our, we want to price an Apple call and an Apple put. And we're going to put in our function. Okay, I have all my inputs in, put in the stock price, the strike price, the estimated current risk-free rate, the using our annualized day functions just for everybody to see if I just copy and paste this down here and run it. The, this is the annualized number of days between 
today and the expiration date. I will note that usually people use 252 days, which is the number of trading days. But when I was working with this model and pricing it, the 365 actually got me a lot closer to the actual value. So I chose to go with 365 in this case. And we'll do that here. The estimated volatility, the implied volatility, and finally the dividend yield. All right, let's run this. And then I am going to print out this little blurb here and let's run this. So our model estimates that the value of the call option is $9.90, while the value of the put option is $8.13. Let's compare this to the actual market. And I have the call option brought up here. And we can see that our model estimates right at $9.90. And this is the current bid price while the ask price is $10.05. So in reality, the actual value, the last price can be a bit obscured depending on how liquid the options are. But in reality, the, the value would be somewhere in between here. And let's take a look at the put value. If I go down right at 160, uh, it's, so it should be somewhere between seven dollars and eighty cents and seven ninety five, and ours was a bit higher, which is not unusual to see. But our call option is in the range. Our put option is a little off, which again isn't too big of a deal because it's relatively close. It's about twenty cents off. Well, I hope that this video was very was helpful. This was a a bridge version and more showing how to implement Black the Black Shoals model within Python, and to get a far more in depth take on it, I highly recommend this book, Options, Futures, and Other Derivatives, by John C. Hole, and there are different editions floating around. This is the definitive textbook for anybody that's looking to learn about options or derivatives in general. Highly recommend it. I had to read it in my underclassman year. And I also read it while I was studying for the financial risk risk manager exam. I also recommend videos by a channel called Bionic Turtle. The proprietor is great. I use this product. I think he does a great job. He has a few things for free. If you're studying for the FRM or CFA exam, you can also purchase his products, which go far more in depth, but any of his free videos are awesome as well. And finally, just some websites where I actually got the information from Yahoo Finance. It's a good source for data and Investopedia is a great reference if you're learning about finance as well. Finally, feel free to connect with me. You can subscribe if you like this video. I hold a lot of Python focused videos. You can also connect with me on LinkedIn, Twitter, and GitHub. Thanks everybody for watching and happy coding.